now a farmer in Equatorial Guinea, will be kicked out of office, you know, because in these societies they had spread fear. Fear is the most potent tool in the hands of African dictators. And cowardice is the Achilles heel, the Achilles heel of the citizenry. So I'm encouraging you not to be afraid. Don't be afraid for me. You should be afraid for the future if we don't do what we are doing now. This is a necessary sacrifice that was made by people like you and me that made it possible for you to live in this country for 29 years and probably not, nothing has ever scratched you before. In fact, when you complain about life here, it's usually complaining about the fact that it's too cold or that your electricity is too much or there's too much heat because you have to pay for it, right? I'm not in any way saying that there is no poverty. Of course, I've lived in America for 19 years. I know that there are a lot of poor Americans and that they have poverty in America. I know about police brutality. I know about racism. But our own case is worse than any of these things. Nigerians would prefer to go and die at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea than to live in Nigeria. A lot of Nigerians prefer to go and live and die as a slave in Libya than to live in a free Nigeria. You, you can understand the gravity of our problem. And nobody, and I keep saying nobody is safe in a country like that. You don't have to offend the government in Nigeria to die in an accident. You don't have to offend the government in Nigeria to be an activist before the house in which you are living newly built can collapse on you and you'll be trapped and you die in it because there's nobody regulating the building of houses corruption has taken over you don't have to offend the government to die of stray bullets in fact more people die in nigeria for refusing to part with small money to the police than most activists who actually go and engage in protests so you can imagine if all of us were protesting at once we would get the country saved and freed from oppression than when we are doing so individually thinking that by hiding away by being cowards we will become free it's not possible so the lawlessness we have had the chaos we've had is something we have to end in 2019 and i urge you barrister not to be discouraged because help is on the way Thank you. Yes, uh, it, it will shock you that uh, there has been an attempt to assassinate me before in Nigeria many times. But I, like I keep telling them, it's, this is not about me now. Uh, and. I am not afraid of them. I'm not afraid of what they can do to my body. I'm more worried about what we can do to rescue the country called Nigeria. And I'm sure that uh, we're close to doing that. Thank you. Well, Can, can you repeat that? I didn't hear that. <laughs> I said, I said, I have a lot of, I have a lot of thoughts, like, thinking about Nigeria and those situations. Yes. But then again, I'm still a small girl, so I don't know if my thoughts are bad. <laughs> so, like, yeah, um, if eventually you are um, elected president of Nigeria come next year, like, well, how do you want to go about the whole situation? Like, where do you want to start? Did you say gentle? No, very intelligent. 
Okay. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, two track questions, lovely, beautiful questions. Um, the first question is, where do we start from? My answer is, you know, the regular refrain. We start from somewhere, right? Uh, but we have 10 starting points to take Nigeria on a path of progress, peace, and prosperity. And Posterity will not forgive us, and I'm using the word us, if we don't do it by starting from those levels. First, we have to do security. We have to secure that country at whatever it will take. We must stop the bloodletting in the country. We must stop criminals from controlling our lives, uh, both violent and non-violent criminals. Like when, you know, when, you, when I say violent criminals, you're talking about kidnapping, terrorism, armed robbery. No violent criminals are those ones who are engaging in, you know, pen robbery uh, and other form of robbing of uh, the national patrimony. Uh, secondly, and I think it's very, very important, we have to declare a state of emergency in the power sector. We have to electrify Nigeria. If everything needs to stop, First, until we electrify and that is provide electricity, we have to do that. Because by putting electricity in Nigeria, by putting light in Nigeria, by lighting up Nigeria, we will have better security, we will have better economy. A lot of things we unleash itself on Nigeria, right? Thirdly, and I'm talking about starting points now, we have to provide infrastructure in Nigeria. There's no reason why anybody going from Lagos to Ibadan should be spending four hours instead of 45 minutes. It just doesn't make any sense. Or that you are going from Lagos to Port Harcourt and you have to spend a whole day or sometimes two days. Or you're going from Lagos to Abuja, the nation's capital. You have to spend 10 hours instead of four hours. This also includes that we have to put plans in place to provide mass transit system for Nigeria. When I was told that we are going to Kent earlier today, the most appealing thing to me was that I'm going to get on a train. I love getting on trains and they said it would take an hour, but eventually we couldn't make it. But now we are connected. Nigeria has to develop its infrastructure, right? And then we move from there to making deliberate efforts in providing employment for Nigerians. We have to provide employment, we have to develop our economy, but I think for you to even start to think about an economy that works for the Nigerian people, you have to provide infrastructure, you have to provide power, and you have to provide security, right? And then education is a mega important because it is education that will then become the powerhouse for sustaining a progressive and prosperous Nigeria. All of you that are out there, some of you came from nowhere. I mean, nowhere. But look at what you are doing with your lives. Some of you came from somewhere, but you are helping to actually organize other societies. You are helping them make do of whatever they have to provide the best services some of the best architects in the world are nigerians doctors nigerians best writers nigerians you know everything that you can imagine nigerians are there but elsewhere but nigeria so there has to be also a deliberate effort to bring back nigerians who have left and who have lost hope who have mentally seceded from nigeria to come back Look, just like the barrister said when you want to go to nigeria the first thing on your mind is, can I make it in and out alive? It's legitimate fear. And if you have that fear, most of the time you don't want to go there. There is something I talk about everywhere I go to speak in the diaspora. It is how we use Nigeria to scare our children. The only way you can get your children to behave is to tell them that you are taking them to Nigeria. And they will behave. Because Nigeria is such a country that is 
what I call, you can use it as a fair factor, you know, just even for employees, if you have an international organization that has Nigerian branch, if you want to punish your employee, it is a way to just say, yeah, we are going to Nigeria. The employee knows that it's another way of saying that we are firing you. Even diplomats, when they send them to Nigeria, they have to pay them special allowances because Nigerian is seen as this bottomless pit where you go and nobody knows if you make it back or not. Places like Palestine has got better electricity than Nigeria. Nigeria and South Sudan are in the same spot in terms of per kilowatt consumption of uh, electricity or availability of electricity. Whereas countries like Libya, Egypt are doing better. So Nigeria has oil, right? But Nigeria is the only oil producing country in the world that takes out its crude oil, sells it, and buys back from the people who are refining Nigeria's crude oil finished products. It's the only country in the world. It just don't make sense. Nigeria don't make sense at its this now. Nigeria is the only country in the world that the president goes to treat headache in London and then returns back home to a welcoming party. Or the son of the president falls off a bicycle, he's taken to Germany, and a Nigerian politician will put a billboard on the way to the airport welcoming the son of the president. I'm not making this up. There's something wrong with us. And I don't shy from saying it. But what I keep telling people is that whatever has been wrong with us is about to be right with us if we choose the right leaders. And we have an opportunity to do that in 2019. Drew Toye and other young people who are running, love them. I love them. It is very heartening that they are running and they are speaking and breathing life into the youthfulness that is desired and desirable for us in the next dispensation. But I'm selling myself to you as Omo Yele Showare and nothing else. With 30 years of activism underneath my belt, consistency underneath my belt, you know, courageous leadership, creativity, innovation, entrepreneurial spirit underneath my belt. That's all I can sell to you. And I hope that they can collaborate with us or that we can come together. You see, something is very, very important that I should mention to those of you who are making the comparisons. I am not here to say that I'm the best. I can't be the best in a country that has 198 million uh, people. But I worry about something regarding other candidates. I don't know that uh, they can withstand <laughs> the criminals and crooks in our country because some of them have not had to deal with them before. Uh, some of them have never been to jail before. Some of them have never been slapped before by police. Me. I have been slapped by police, I have been expelled from the university, I have fought the military, I have fought court gangs, I have fought all the corrupt governors in Nigeria, I have written about them, I have dared them, I have stood in courtrooms, I have I've helped to send some of them to jail, I have helped to recover money in Nigeria, you know, I have fought all the witches and wizards in that place. So the other guys... I don't know if they can withstand pressure, you know, I don't know honestly and I'm being honest but I love them and I encourage them to keep pushing until one of us can rescue the country and reclaim Nigeria. That is my final answer.
Uh, thank you so much. Again, what has to happen in education is actually multifaceted. And I'm going to shock you guys a little bit uh, with the fact that <laughs> one of the things that needs to happen with Nigeria education is that we have to rebuild our curriculum. The curriculum in our education is the one that the British brought to us. And I'm speaking from London, so you understand that I'm looking us in the eye uh, and saying to ourselves, our education is an education that is meant to train us to work for somebody as opposed to understand our environment. When I did geography and planning at the University of Lagos, I had more interest. Our professors had more interest in teaching us about the five American lakes than they taught us about lakes that are based in Nigeria. But that's just one thing. That's the philosophical part of what needs to happen with our education. The rest is economic and financial. We have to invest in education. We cannot continue the way we are now. And a lot of value orientation needs to happen in the education sector. Don't let me lie to you. There is nobody in Nigeria. Let me say 60% of our education in Nigeria now is based on fraud. I do this as an investigative reporter. Even from primary school, parents are buying teachers or buying people they call mercenaries to write exams for their children from primary school. If you go to do YEG, people are buying Expo to do YEG. You go to the university, lecturers are being paid off to award. And I've heard of professors who help their students write their project and make money off of it. They sell plagiarized books, you know, so the value reorientation that needs to happen will also have to happen with a lot of investment and infusion in the education system of competent hands. We have no option. We have to bring in people who are good teachers. That's why we want to hire 200,000 teachers for primary and secondary education right off the back. The same thing we want to do for primary health care. We'll talk about that later. And our universities have to be monitored to be sure that the administrative system of the university is unbundled from the academic system of the of our, of our system. The reason why I'm saying this is that I've also been a university teacher, what they call professor in the U.S. for close to 10 years. And what I saw is that, you know, you have to ease university teachers from the burden of administration on, on campus so that the teacher is not the same person who is responsible for so many things that they are doing now. They focus basically and mostly on education. And the administrative sector is there to support the professors or teachers. And students must also be given a voice to determine what they want. We have gotten a lot of things wrong with our education, including mostly the administrators. So importantly also, we must make education qualitative and free for now, so that we can catch up with the rest of the world. Another thing is that we must introduce technology at the lowest level. It, it makes me sad, it makes me sad, right, to know that our system of education is less in some places, you know, what my daughter knows in the US as someone who is an equivalent of primary four is more than what people who are in year one in some high institutions do. Her library is bigger than that of my high school, which I graduated from in 1985. By the way, my high school in Nondo State, a community high school, is the same desk that I left there in 1985 that is still there. It's the same louver window, the, con the thing they call louver. The windows, you know, the ones that clap when you close them. It's the same thing that is still there. Half of them are blown off by winds and nobody has replaced them. Because every year, meanwhile, there are at least four intervention programs that are concurrently working in the education sector in Nigeria. You have the, uh, in the Niger Delta region where I'm from, you have the NDDC, you have uh, the higher institution tax, education tax intervention. There are about three different interventions but they are just avenues for stealing and waste and mismanagement. That has to end. The moment we are spending the right amount of money in the education and appropriately and they are not frittered away and mismanaged and stolen, we will be able to get qualitative education into the body, heart and soul and brains of our kids. There's no question about that. 
but it has to be deliberate intervention. You are sitting in this class today, and uh, I can talk to you virtually. I went to the University of Ibadan about three weeks ago when I went back to Nigeria to hire a hall for the university. They are still writing receipts with long hand, and they still have to bring out a bucket of water to count the cash. Nobody is doing that anymore. University of Ibadan. So that means that the university is no longer even powering a technologically driven society because the university hasn't gotten it right. How can it contribute to society? So, but it's a long story. What I've seen, uh, but I can tell you that I have the exposure to understand what needs to be done and done immediately to start to turn things around. Yes. Everyone. I'm from Canada, so unfortunately I can't. You're from Canada? Yes. You're welcome to Nigeria. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I'm actually researching the tensions between counterterrorism and human rights protection in West Africa. So, um, what is your opinion on the current state? Can you repeat that, please? Can you repeat that, please? Yes. What is your opinion on the current state of it in Nigeria? Okay, so I have uh, covered uh, terrorism for close to 12 years, particularly covering Boko Haram. And uh, I've also covered the Nigerian military from the angle of uh, human rights. And uh, it is nothing to write home about. I'll be the first to admit to it. Our military is not uh, practicing what they should in terms of protecting rights. And uh, what we get from the military intervention in fighting terrorism is actually emboldening uh, terrorism. I'll tell you, for example, that the majority of the terrorist activities that has afflicted Nigeria in the last few years were actually created by mistakes made in, in I mean, which led to violations of human rights. What do you think caused the Niger Delta insurgency? It was the violation of rights, I mean, of the environment first, but most importantly, it was the sacrifice that was made. A human rights activist and playwright named Ken Sarawiwa was sacrificed to international oil companies. He was summarily, summarily tried in a kangaroo court, killed, uh, by hanging by the military and that was what led to the surgency in the Niger Delta region We moved from there when the civilian regime came they went and bombed a village called Odi All of you are aware of it violated the rights of the people there even with Boko Haram It wasn't until when their leader was arrested and summarily killed in a police station that it took the turn it took now And that's what Nigeria is paying for you go to the southeast the Southeast were just lucky that he didn't turn ugly because Nigeria, instead of resolving some of the issues that had to do with their grievances uh, with uh, the indigenous people of Biafra, they went and sent in soldiers to quell them. So before you knew it, it was going to become another major insurrection because of violations of human rights. And we have evidence of this. So the government of Nigeria has not done anything to protect the rights of its people and as a result whenever it sows uh, the wild wind as they call it they, we, we, we harvest hurricanes from insurgency and that counter-terrorism measure has to change we have to put at the heart of our counter-terrorism measures the protection of human rights by our soldiers our uh, military officers and police and for someone like me, uh, it's a cardinal thing because I am actually a human rights activist and have worked assiduously to fight against torture. Uh, I've spoken extensively and traveled with Amnesty International in the US uh, as a victim of torture. I'm, I'm a victim of torture myself and I cannot lead a country where the violation of human rights or the practice of torture is acceptable. Uh, both locally and internationally, I will be a voice against torture even if it means that uh, we will offend 
even some of uh, the powerful nations of the world who think that they can use it uh, as a cardinal uh, uh, position to fight terrorism. It's not acceptable. So, but we know these things are which fully, fully integrates, you know, the practices of, uh, I mean, uh, the international best practices for human rights in the government by working with organizations like Amnesty International, of which I'm a member in the U.S., and uh, uh, to ensure that we have a country that have massive, massive respect for human rights. Do we have any more questions? Uh, yes. Um, okay, sir. My name is Sir Kelly Damla. Uh, nice to um, you. Please talk about your activism over the last 29 years, I think. And I really commend you for that. But what I want really wanted to know is really be an activist. I've been mean, a uh, the president, you have to be more diplomatic and um, faster a lot of procedures. So I was just really wondering, because even Barry, when he was elected, when he was running for election, and he was saying, I'm going to tackle corruption and stuff like that, but I like, wasn't able to do that. I was going to ask, like, how would you bypass this? No, bypass, but like, get past this procedures and um, the need to be diplomatic and all these problems that might occur in your fight for corruption. Yes, yeah, so you're asking if uh, how I intend to bypass the problems that uh, often confront uh, leaders who promise to fight corruption. Yeah, because there are, there are some difficulties because of the procedures, rule of law, and the rest of it. Yes. So the first thing to, that we're doing is to ensure that uh, you, we don't uh, come to the presidency uh, via the purchasing order that they do in Nigeria. What I mean by purchasing order is usually uh, the cabal that are interested in perpetuating corruption in Nigeria will bond together and they will give massive amount of money to the presidential candidates and they will purchase the candidate his uh, form for him you guys knew that president buhari claimed that he didn't have money but somehow he was able to get 27 million naira to purchase his form to contest for presidency in those days following that it turned out that he collected a lot of money from uh, very corrupt sources and uh, when he got to office he just couldn't uh, do away with them because he was he had gotten in bed with them either directly or indirectly so he had to protect their interests special interest is the name for it it is the name for the game and what we are doing is bypassing and disrupting that process by ensuring that all of our fundraising is transparent and open and we are going out there to ensure that when this is done when this is done we are left with no doubt that our coming to office is publicly funded by public spirited individuals not the cabal that is controlling the oil industry not the cabal that is controlling in different kinds of black markets in the country not the political cabal that is waiting to get contracts that they will not implement so when you look at all the cabals, and I know all of them, having done reporting on Nigeria political system for more than 12 years, having fought the military, fought civilians, and fought all kinds of people, I know them. So as long as you are not in bed with them, you have no problem. What is hampering President Buhari's fight against corruption is that he is in bed and surrounded by corrupt people. And there's nothing he can do to wriggle himself out of it. If you combine that with his weakness and lack of capacity and as we now know illness then you have nothing to fight there's nobody to fight if you let if you, when I'm elected into office you will have an energizer bunny in uh, in the presidential office who is not afraid to take on special interest because that's what I've been doing that's been my career uh, my entire life That's fine. Okay, good. You see, the thing with politicians is that sometimes there's no substance to their claims and the proposals. And so far, what I've heard from you is you've stated the problems and 
one of the key problems you say is leadership. And you make, you make it sound as though leadership is the only problem you have. I mean, I know you have said, um, you have mentioned education, you have mentioned uh, you know, electricity infrastructure and stuff like that. And you're saying you will do it, you will do it. But there's no detail to it because it's easier said than done and saying, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But this, our problem is deeper than that. With terrorism, you have tra- tribalism, um, you know, embroiled. Em- em- that's the right word. No. <laughs> you, have to, you, have, you have tribalism involved in, in you know, the sentiments of, you know, that people are. The people actually in Nigeria, most of them in the north, they actually still believe that Buhari is doing the right thing because he's from the north. People are content with that. The people that be content with the fact that an evil man is there, not because an evil man is doing something right, but because an evil man is there. So, so why, how are you going to prove to me or tell me that, be, and people are going to look at you as a Yoruba man first before an activist. That is the truth. And so, before you move on, before we, I, I can, there's some people that will not move past that path. So, how would you overcome the tribalistic and ne- 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 nepotic uh, and, and corrupt? Uh, you know, sentiments that people have. Thank you very much. You raised very important questions. Instead of attacking me, you should have asked me <laughs> to give you the breakdown. Uh, what you should understand is that these things come in different formats, considering where I am. Uh, and for example, we, I have actually spoken extensively about, you know, in detail, what we tend to do about security. What we tend to do about power. For example, we said that we will, and I said that today at the BBC, that we are bringing 4,500 megawatts of renewable energy to Nigeria, northern Nigeria. And what is renewable energy? Solar alone. And just so that you are not in doubt about this, I said you can look at Morocco. Morocco is now selling power to Malta and France because they had the foresight to develop their solar energy sector by creating, I mean, by building 4,500 megawatts of electricity. So that is one solution. We have mentioned how many kilometers of roads we will build to give us the infrastructure we need. In particular, we mentioned that we will create an interstate highway system in Nigeria that connects all the region by dual carriage way. I just mentioned to you that in the health sector, first we have to attack the primary health sector issue by deploying pe- most people in Nigeria, including some of your relatives, and I'm not saying it to degrade you, have never taken their blood pressure before. So to stop the carnage of avoidable death, and most people die from stress and you know health-related issues, that will have two 160,000 healthcare professionals heading in their direction. 200,000 teachers heading in the direction of education. So we have immediate solutions that are there. When you talk about terrorism, or this whole thing about Buhari, I have to say though, and it's very, very important, that we don't trivialize Nigeria by saying that Northern Nigeria believes that Buhari is doing what is right. I just came from Northern Nigeria, and not just Northern I went to Kano, I went to Kaduna, and nobody can tell you that Buhari is doing anything for them. The worst road I have been in the last three months is the Kano Kaduna Road. If there's anybody from there, they will tell you. You think Northerners are happy about it? When we were talking to the people in the north, women, they were talking about sending their children to school. They kept mentioning Makaranta because they, which is the name for schools, because they understand that education will help to lift them out of poverty. The poorest part of Nigeria is northern Nigeria. There's no need exaggerating it. Do they want to get out of poverty? Yes. Do they think that Buhari could bring them? That's exactly the reason they voted for Buhari. They believe that he could get them out of poverty. They call him Megaskia, the man of the truth. But today, they themselves are heartbroken. So don't let us be overplaying this. Buhari had lost three elections in the same Nigeria. And now he's about to lose the fourth time, courtesy of the way we are approaching politics. Buhari is no longer popular in northern Nigeria. Let me break it down for you. The people of Plato are not going to vote for Buhari because of what he did by overlooking 
the Fulani Hesman farmers crisis. The same thing will happen in uh, in uh, in in Benue. The Shiites, the people who are Shiites, there are about ten million of them. They are not voting for Buhari because Buhari summarily executed their members and buried them in mass graves. Don't think those people will vote for Buhari. The people who he promised that he will wipe Boko Haram from their villages, they are still waiting for him. I don't think they will vote for Buhari. So, tribalism is a tool that has been thrown by our leaders to divide and conquer us. And a lot of people have seen beyond that. And I have seen it because I just came from Nigeria. You mentioned that I'm Yoruba man. You don't even know where I come from. Because I'm not about my ethnicity and I'm not going to disclose it to you at this event. <laughs> it's true. Most of you don't even know where I come from. But people accept my message or the message we are giving to them because they know that we are not ethnic by God. The younger generation Nigerians have seen true ethnicity and nepotism. Yes, Buhari is a nepotistic head of state. He was elected as the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. But by his own design, he became the school prefect or senior prefect of Dara High School. That is his problem. And the rest of Nigeria has seen through that, that Buhari is not a national leader. Are they going to vote for Buhari in the Southeast? My answer is no. Is he going to get another term from the Southwest people? I would say nah. And is he going to get any vote from the South South? No. North Central, that's include Benue, Plateau, even Kwara. I don't see it happening. So where is the magic going to come to continue as a nepotistic and tribalistic leader? I think Nigerians are coming around understanding that even the so-called zoning and uh, turn by turn politics is not working for them if you go to the southeast who are the gov who is the governor of Imo state is a southeasterner even though by way of his performance people are questioning where he comes from but let's even leave that alone if you go to Oweri, you you would want to go and try Rochas Okorosha in the international criminal court for crimes against humanity the place is broken. There's, it didn't seem as if there was government in a way. It took us longer to get from, it, get, it, it was shorter to get from Lagos by air to a way than it took us to get from the airport in a way to the hotel. The place is in shambles. Is it not from there? So leadership is key. My brother, you cannot overrule. It is because of leadership that we don't have all the things. The leadership that you are asking for, the, the question you are asking from me, is actually the easiest thing to do. I can go on Google and go and download and tell you that these are the things I will do. I will do magic, I will do magic, I will do magic. But the thing is, you will need to look at my background. You need to look at my character. You need to look at my consistency before you can believe those things. Otherwise, you are going to fall into the hands of the same 419 leaders that have been leading Nigeria. Didn't they say that Babangida was the best leader at the time in Nigeria? Because why? He knew how to dribble people until he dribbled himself out of uh, power. So I don't know what we need to do to convince ourselves that we need to go in a fresh direction. We have tried two presidents now who used to be former president. This is where they left us. We have tried the military option. We've tried the civilian option. We've tried military guys who used to be military and they became civilians. We've tried some young people and then we've tried a lot of old people now it's time to try something fresh and that is the person who is engaging with you now i am presenting myself based on integrity and my integrity is verifiable integrity you know so you don't have to go too far to know that i'm the guy who used to do sahara reporters and the guy who used to go to those meetings to challenge leaders and the guy who used to bring out all the doziers of the corrupt people and the guy who used to lead all those protests that you talk about including the one where we went and disrupted the ministers uh, whole town hall meeting in new york in those days or the guy who took on a minister of communication on radio two weeks ago and as the uh, outcome of that uh, encounter was they said we took him to the cleaners. I don't know yet, until next year, before I can convince myself that we took them to the cleaners. But we need to do that very quick and fast. So, please, I want you to keep an eye on this. And like I said, if you cannot support me and you feel that I'm not convincing enough, please find another young person to follow. Please do not follow any of these old, ragged, corrupt, incompetent, mediocre 
in the country. That's my charge to you. Thank you, my sister from Ghana. Um, is it in Ghana the place where they would drill computer on the blackboard? Yes. yes. You guys still got a long way to go. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, that, that's, uh, that's on the lighter side. Honestly, I travel to Ghana frequently and it's so sad to admit to you that if we can get Nigeria to where Ghana is today, a lot of Nigerians will return home like tomorrow, like you know. Uh, but what we are saying here is that if you, if you look at the Ghanaian economy, who do you think is running the Nigerian economy? Nigerian economy? It's Nigerian money, you know. A lot of our rich people are there. We are the ones managing your telecommunication networks, we are the ones bringing money through your banks. Every bank in Nigeria has a Ghanaian uh, corresponding bank, and we are doing well because we are not doing too well. So you guys better brace because when we take all of our funds back from you, you know, you might need to be a little bit more innovative uh, in running your economy because a lot of our monies are now running the Ghanaian economy. But here is what it is. The reason I mentioned that is that most of Nigeria's wealth is looted and taken outside of the country to develop other parts of the world. You should just go to Dubai and know how much we've invested there. Go to the property market here in the UK. If you know how much of Nigeria's money has been invested here, just between 2012 and 2015, when the last regime in Nigeria was kicked out, it has been revealed that over $2 billion, maybe about a I mean, $1.5 million billion of Nigeria's oil money had come to the property markets in the UK or somehow passed through the UK banks. It is part of the problem. We punish our corrupt people, but the UK don't punish their corrupt banks and bankers and investment uh, bankers, they call them. But, you know, that will be resolved when we have the right leadership in place. So, corruption is one of the sources one of the reasons why we can't pay our teachers. Do you know how much we pay our teachers? We pay, we, you know, we pay our civil servants, we pay them 18,000 Naira per month. That is equivalent, the equivalent of $50 per month. Even your country, Ghana, is paying people more money than that per month. The minimum wage in Ghana is higher than that of Nigeria. But here is another factor. And I'm breaking it down to you, sister, is that 21% of Nigeria's civil servants are ghost workers, fake workers. They don't exist and we pay them salaries. They just found 80,000 of such people within Nigeria police about three weeks ago. So by the time we purge ghost workers out of our civil service system, our weight bill will be reduced. And our plan is to pay Nigerian workers 100 thousand hundred thousand naira per month that is the minimum wage living. and we have calculated that is a good starting min, uh, living wage we have to proceed from there very quickly but the question is what is also the tax rate in nigeria it's also lower than ghana ghana's tax rate is about 16 percent you're collecting about 60 percent nigeria is still at about 70 percent miserable 70 percent which means we are not collecting the taxes we deserve to be collecting to pay for social services. The same thing is happening with companies in Nigeria. You know, Guinness, as I mentioned them, I'm not afraid to say it. They were owing us 5 billion naira last year. They only ended up paying 800 million. And the rest of the money, they do what they call party party in Nigeria. I'll rub my back, I rub your back. If you can have a president that can help collect all the taxes, that generate revenue and we plug all the leakages, 
you will have more than enough money to pay for the services. But there's the cash. If we stop all the leakages, we'll be saving five billion dollars every year in Nigeria uh, from corrupt people. And the number one corruption fighter that you can ever have is the person that is sitting from uh, in front of you via Skype today. I know how to stop all these guys from taking our monies out of the country. I know how to create the paper trail. And the moment we save five billion dollars from corruption, we are only paying workers one point five billion dollars. If and when I mean when we increase the uh, minimum wage to a living wage of hundred thousand, so we will still have three point five billion dollars to play around with. If you add that to the tax base and the tax collection rate that we intend to increase, how we intend to stop leakages and increase our revenue base by creating employment, by providing electricity and all the multiplier effects that are out there that will come from just serious leadership. And I come to leadership, my brother, who is talking about leadership. There's no reason why the Lagos Ibadan Highway should be fixed for over 20 years now. They have not been able to finish it. These are things that should be done in months. And the loss that you get from doing all this costs, it just costs you too much. Right now, nobody's talking about it, but we have started selling oil at 70 barrel, uh, 70 dollars per barrel again. And hunger is still pervasive in Nigeria. Why? Because we're spending most of that money helping our president to take treatment in the UK, parking his jet for 170 days at 5,000 euros per night. These are unquestionable ways of uh, spending money. And on top of that, we are funding greedy people. It is time to take that money and fund those who are in need of Nigeria's financial help. Yes. Uh, I happened to be uh, present at a, a rally you were speaking at uh, as president, and I just looked at you and I wondered how did this young person get himself into so much trouble? <laughs> <laughs> you were surrounded by all these older guys, and it was top politics, top quality student unionism. Yes. And myself, how did it just why is it not easier for him to be at home? Uh, you have not ceased to impress me since then. I was impressed then. I am impressed again. I'm asking myself, how did he get himself into this kind of shit again? <laughs> <laughs> you are going for the top job. Yes. I wish you all the best. I'm sure everybody here will wish you the best. Uh, and you have a long way, a long road ahead of you to navigate. So, uh, one last question, and we'll let you go, because I understand you are still going for another... Yes, meeting. another meeting, yes. And tomorrow, we will be having a big rally, a uh, town hall event. In London, in yes. London, yes, and uh, we are looking forward to that. I will be there, certainly, and some people uh, are going to My last question for you. Uh, as president of Nigeria, what would be the foreign policy of Nigeria? Uh, what, what would be your take on the foreign policy thrust of Nigeria? Would it be the same old thing, Africa being the centerpiece of Nigerian foreign policy, or are you going to change it in favor of any other, uh, you know, regional focus? And uh, by maybe more specific, what would be your take on the China-Africa relationship, China-Nigeria relationship, as opposed to the good old Europe and uh, U.S. focus that we've had? What's your foreign policy going to be? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That's a very, very good question. But um, the foreign policy of Nigeria right now is driven by foreigners. That's the truth. And what I've seen in recent years is that uh, this is kind of a cold war coming back again. And all of it is economic. Look, the truth is that Nigeria is being treated as a mining site as opposed to being a country. And when you have a country as big as Nigeria being treated as a mining site, 
the foreign policy of Nigeria is treated, of the foreign engagement of Nigeria with the rest of the world, is treated based on resources that Nigeria can provide to the world. It's not treated based on the integrity of the Nigeria or of, or of Nigeria's territory and its people. So our foreign policy will be focused on respect for the Nigerian states and the Nigerian peoples. And that would, of course, I would not lie to you that I want our foreign policy to be centered around Africa, but it's in such a way that Africa can become more united and become a bigger player in, on the world stage. That is definitely going to be it. But what needs to happen is this, and there's no foreign policy that you can have that is going to be respectable if you don't have a government. The way I see Nigeria is like Nigeria has no government, you know, and you find out that all of our policies are dictated from outside to us and it's dictated based not on our strength but our weaknesses. So I go to China and the US and Europe. Again, it boils down to our resources. You know, they want our resources and then they dictate to us who we should follow. For example, US is very agitated about our relationship with China. China is happy that Nigeria is also uh, providing its least leeway. But how about we build our country to the point where people start coming to us and say, you know, uh, please help us, as opposed to this one that we are going to everybody to help us. The reason why China and Europe and US dominate our foreign policy so much is that they have to help us get everything we need. We don't produce anything. Uh, we don't we are not respected. We are not respected as a country. We are not respect, respected as a people. Our passport is viewed with, you know, uh, scorn everywhere we go. So I would not tell you specifically what I would do about China. I don't want to get in the mix of how China and the U.S. Uh, and all of them are trying to penetrate Nigeria. What it tells me if they are so interested in Nigeria is that Nigeria has got something to offer. And I'm sure that by the time they see the quality of leadership that we assemble in Nigeria, when we win in 2019, it will be very clear to them the direction in which we are headed and where we want to head. So, in the referring to me as the little boy who used to like trouble, now I've grown to like even more trouble. But, you know, the trouble I have now is a good trouble to have because it's a trouble that is about to save what's largest country for black people and i want to say finally that our policy foreign policy would extend to you know include the promotion of the betterment of the dignity of the black man because if nigeria gets it right i think a lot of black people will be proud to be black Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I apologize once again for using this, but this is the future. You know, I want to be the president of Nigeria that can speak to you directly from the presidential office, not Villa. I don't want to call it a Villa because I'll, I'll be working from anywhere. I'll be working virtually from anywhere via Skype. You know, that's why I've been saying that, you know, these analog leaders have to go so that we can practice governance by digital technology. Yes, although we have about just uh, a dozen or because it's called 20 or 30 people here, uh, definitely thousands will see this interview because we are placing it on the web. And yes. that, that is the magic of the moment we live in. Absolutely. Uh, so we're looking forward to also your promise to come to Kent. Uh, I'm coming to Kent. Like I said, I, I, I have a found one of the things that happened to me was the lecture I delivered at Kent last year. It, it, you know, it, it gave me it gave me a new direction after after leaving that place. I just thought to myself, "Oh my God, there's there's some so there's something very divine." You know, now speaking religiously about coming to Kent. The last time I came there, and how the role that played in what I'm doing today. So thank you, Kent, and Kent Shawara will be back. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.